Good morning or good evening. This is Mark Arnold, Senior Vice President of Marketing with Zap Surgical. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for our 10th webinar of the Winter SRS webinar series. Held every Thursday between now and May 13, the new series does include 12 talks over 12 weeks. So if you haven't already, I do encourage everyone to visit srswebinars.com to review not only the upcoming talks, but also register to be recordings of prior webinars as well. And one final item of business before we get started. If you'd like to submit typewritten questions at any time during today's talk, you can do so by using the Q&A button found in the Zoom console. And time permitting, your questions will be addressed at the end of today's presentation. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. John Adler. Dr. Adler is the CEO and co-founder of Zap Surgical, inventor of the CyberKnife system, and Professor Emeritus of Neurosurgery and Radiation Oncology at Stanford University. Dr. Adler. Um, thank you, Mark. And um, thank you everyone for joining us uh, this morning and this evening or wherever you are in the world today. Um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, today's speaker, um, a notable contributor to the world of uh, academic research in the field of uh, stereotactic radio surgery. And uh, I'd also like to say a friend, uh, uh, Dr. Roberge, uh, has uh, been trained uh, throughout Canada, mostly at McGill, but I'm particularly proud of the fact that he spent some time with me at Stanford uh, a long time ago doing a, a radiosurgical fellowship. Uh, but over the course of his career, he has uh, published widely. Uh, he has contributed, I think, in significant ways to our understanding of how radiosurgery works and a range of different conditions. And he's a, he's a free thinker. Um, and I have immense respect for what he's done in it. Uh, and uh, over two terms as head of the Department of Radiation Oncology at CHUM, he's uh, built out uh, some an amazing uh, facility, uh, in, implementing some of the world's best technologies. And it was just a, a brilliant leader over the course of uh, the better part of a decade. So uh, without further ado, I uh, invite uh, David to give his talk today, uh, which is going to discuss a phase three trial of radiosurgery versus uh, is that hippocampal sparing, whole brain radiotherapy for multiple metastases from five to 15. So uh, David, tell me what you're up to. David, you may be muted. I, I am. I was just sparing you the, uh, the, the, the cardiac arrest uh, warning here. Okay. <laughs> I'm all right. So hopefully you can see the correct screen. Uh, we do. All right. So thank you for that very uh, kind uh, introduction. I, I promise I did not pay for it. Uh, I'm going to take the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes to talk about a trial that I've invested a lot of my time in, uh, looking at building some prospective uh, high-level evidence for the use of radiosurgery for multiple brain metastasis. Uh, the trial is led at the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, but I want to thank my collaborators in the other members of this intergroup process at NRG and at the Alliance. So we'll be uh, going over a little bit my own institution. I, I take every opportunity I can to uh, pitch for my institution. We'll go over the background for this trial, the evidence that we already have or don't have, and then trying to think a little bit beyond, uh, beyond this trial. So if asked, you'll be able to say you saw a conflict of interest uh, slide. My most important conflict is that I, I enjoy the uh, company of uh, Dr. Uh, Adler. This uh, maybe doesn't put me in the most uh, select uh, uh, group, but uh, uh, I, I also uh, hope I can uh, uh, call him my, uh, my friend. So my institution, SHIM, is uh, the University Hospital of the University of Montreal. I guess that's why they don't translate it from the, the French. It's a bit of a mouthful. It's the uh, oldest hospital in uh, North America. It burnt down before the uh, advent of the camera. So this is uh, version 2.0 that was built 
on the ruins of the prior hospital in uh, 1861 and uh, has been used until we uh, moved out of it in 2017 to this nice uh, campus that's changed the uh, skyline of uh, Montreal. And uh, hopefully uh, within the next year, we'll be able to have uh, visitors and conventions in the, the beautiful auditorium. So the, the hospital has uh, integrated uh, architectural uh, elements inside and uh, it makes us very proud. We unfortunately being in radiation oncology live in the sub sub basement of this uh, complex. So to give you an idea, uh, uh, over the last 12 months, uh, uh, despite the drop uh, related to the pandemic, we've had approximately 3,800 new patient starts in our building. And of those, uh, 405 were for uh, brain metastases. We have 20 uh, radiation oncologists, five of which uh, practice in the field of uh, brain metastases. And uh, we currently have a portfolio of active uh, brain metastasis trials in radiation oncology, which include the trial we're discussing today, a uh, trial with uh, tumor uh, treating fields, a fractionation trial from the intergroup process, and a novel uh, radioactive antibody fragment to treat uh, brain metastases in uh, HER2 positive uh, cancers. So as a background to the current trial, I think we're all well aware of the multiple trials that have been conducted for uh, the use of radiosurgery in patients with uh, one to four metastases. I think these trials have mostly in common that with the exception maybe of patients with a single metastasis, the outcomes as far as overall survival are the same irrespective of the treatment, but uh, distant brain failures and local control are better with a whole brain, but at the cost of a significant impact on a cognitive function and a, a quality of life. So why not just uh, extend these treatments to uh, five, six, 10, 20 metastases? Well, because the number of metastases, as we can see from this uh, nomogram, is one of the strongest predictors of early distant brain failure. So if you're exposing a patient to the risks of uh, radiation necrosis, to the cost and complexity of a treatment, you would like for them not to come back on the next MRI and have multiple new uh, metastases and not uh, have intracranial control or not really prevent or delay whole brain radiotherapy. That said, this is a treatment that's already commonly uh, performed. What type of evidence do we have to support uh, that practice? Well, we have mainly retrospective or uh, prospective observ observational uh, data and the conclusion of these different uh, publications or trials is that radiosurgery for multiple metastases is safe. However, one wants to define, the, define safe. It's certainly technically uh, feasible and, and with devices being more and more efficient, that's even becoming more and more uh, feasible. And that if you look at the overall survival, which I'll argue is not a very good metric of the uh, efficacy of uh, uh, treatment, uh, the survival seems to be similar for patients that have more than a single uh, brain metastasis. And that survival is comparable to historic standards or uh, to treatment with whole brain radiotherapy. I'll be a little bit provocative and say that treatment of whole brain radiotherapy produces a survival that might be similar to uh, supportive care. And um, it's noted, of course, that uh, uh, whole brain radiotherapy is associated with uh, different toxicities. This is an example of one of you know, the better known manuscripts in this field, comparing the outcomes of patients treated for uh, two to nine metastases versus more than 10 metastases with radiosurgery, showing that the survival is similar, I would say, at this period in time was not very good with uh, either treatment and that toxicity 
admittedly, the patients with a large number of metastases were likely highly selected to have small metastases, didn't seem to be uh, increased. Still, uh, we would like to have uh, higher level uh, evidence to support this uh, practice that's become quite common. But unfortunately, there's quite a graveyard of uh, failed uh, clinical trials in this uh, space. Um, some examples of trials that have uh, died for lack of accrual are uh, recently presented trial of whole brain versus radio surgery for four to 15 metastases out of MD Anderson. They were able to accrue less than half of what they were expecting as far as a sample size. Uh, unsurprisingly, they did show as we would expect that time to distant brain failure is improved uh, with a uh, whole brain uh, radiotherapy. And also with this conventional whole brain radiotherapy and without uniform use of memantine, the cognitive impact of whole brain radiotherapy was uh, much higher than that of uh, radiosurgery. They've noted things that uh, we expect, but don't always quantify that patients spend less time off of systemic therapy uh, when they have radiosurgery than when they have whole brain radiotherapy. But uh, with the small sample size, uh, we're not able to uh, show a, a difference in uh, overall survival if there is one. The Dutch had a multi-center trial, uh, very uh, similar. Uh, maybe more typical of the practice outside of the United States, the whole brain radiotherapy was more hypofractionated, so a, a five fraction uh, regimen. Uh, also conventional whole brain, uh, in this case, uh, without any uh, memantine, the accrual was even lower uh, by the time the trial was uh, abandoned. And uh, again, because of the very small uh, sample size, it was uh, difficult to show any statistically significant conclusions. There's a, uh, a group the, around uh, the gamma knife uh, device that uh, wanted to perform a, a similar trial. I'm not sure any patients, or if so, very few were accrued to this trial before it was abandoned possibly for a mix of uh, feasibility and uh, financial uh, issues. Finally, there's one uh, survivor in addition to the trial we're talking about today, there's an ongoing trial at Dana-Farber that's uh, nearly half accrued uh, to radio surgery versus the hippocampal avoiding whole brain, but without uh, the mandatory uh, memantine, looking at what's a very, very pertinent uh, outcome, which is quality of life. So why have some of these trials uh, had difficulty accruing? I think one of the reasons is that the standard arm is not very uh, attractive. Uh, uh, whole brain radiotherapy as used in many of these trials is a treatment that's been around for multiple uh, decades that's somewhat uh, uh, archaic in that it's treating the entire uh, cranial uh, contents using, uh, again, technology from uh, a different century. What we do know is that when uh, memantine is given in addition to conventional whole brain radiotherapy, there is a benefit in terms of cognitive function. In my personal uh, practice, I prescribe to the vast majority of my patients uh, this drug, which is a very well tolerated drug. And more recently, we've seen that uh, avoiding the hippocampal structures can give additional benefit on top of uh, the benefit of uh, memantine without uh, causing any uh, detriment and with a minimal, if any, uh, increase in uh, intracranial failures. So if one looks at these two uh, strategies, you were talking about a 20 some odd percent reduction in cognitive toxicity from uh, the memantine, an additional uh, a little bit more than 25% reduction in cognitive toxicity from the addition of uh, hippocampal avoidance. And these benefits are 
across a range of cognitive domains as we test them in this sort of uh, trial. So the trial I'm talking about today is uh, uh, in the same vein. So it's uh, radio surgery versus what's felt to be the most optimal form of whole brain radiotherapy. So that's radiotherapy with hippocampal avoidance and with a mandatory use of uh, memantine. The eligibility criteria are what they are. So for now, it's uh, capped at a total of 15 metastases. And for uh, safety concerns from our, our funders, the total volume of the metastases to be treated is capped at 30 cubic centimeters and the largest diameter of a metastasis to be treated capped at 2.5 uh, centimeters. So the eligibility criteria beyond that are pretty simple. Contrary to other trials, patients with actionable, actionable mutations or immunotherapy are not excluded. Uh, patients can have at the physician's discretion systemic therapy pretty much all the way up to the radiation and starting almost immediately after uh, the radiation. S patients with surgical resections are not uh, allowed in this trial unless the, the surgery was only uh, a biopsy. So the primary uh, endpoints for different reasons are time to neurocognitive uh, progression and overall uh, survival. So when the trial started, it wasn't with hippocampal avoidance and uh, that was changed in an amendment. And when that amendment occurred, the total number of patients was kept the same, but the effect size that we're looking for uh, changed. I think what's more interesting is that we have a wide variety of secondary endpoints in this trial. So some obvious ones, the clinical ones, uh, time to CNS failure, the failure pattern, the number and nature of salvage procedures, the individual cognitive test results, adverse event, time off of systemic therapy, and validation of this uh, nomogram meant to predict early distant brain failure. And it might very well be that once this trial has concluded that we decide that there isn't really a clear winner or loser, but that there's subpopulation of patients that are uh, better suited for one treatment or for the other. And the other endpoints, we have economic endpoints. So this is not only billing to the insurer, but in select uh, Canadian and US sites, the actual cost of uh, doing the treatment based on the time spent uh, preparing those treatments. We've seen in my own practice that in reality, the cost of delivering radiosurgery is not higher than the cost of delivering uh, whole brain radiotherapy. There's other uh, endpoints that we can go through as well. So as I said, the economic is not just from a payer's perspective, but from what it actually costs to deliver the treatment. In the imaging endpoint, I think we're gonna be able to collect prospectively uh, imaging. We'll be able to look at different things, such as the, the type of MRI that was done, whether you know, using a lower dose of gadolinium, lower field MRI maybe leads to more early uh, distant failures because we're not detecting small metastasis or the, the converse. We'll also evaluate serial changes uh, in those MRIs and see if they may predict either tumor control or uh, cognitive dysfunction. I think the dose symmetric endpoints are very exciting because this is an intergroup trial with a large number of participating centers, we're gonna have a variety of different dosimetries for the same metastasis. So right now I would say it's more opinion-based uh, how you should treat with radiosurgery as far as coverage or normal tissue exposure. Now we'll have a variety of dosimetries collected prospectively that we can correlate maybe with local control or radiation necrosis. The radio surgery is pretty standard and pretty uh, flexible. So obviously, since the large tumors are not allowed in the trial, uh, there's not as many dose levels. There's dose reductions that are allowed for uh, brainstem metastases. And because some of these um, centers will be community centers that may not deliver radio surgery, a community center could randomize a patient 
And if they're randomized to radio surgery, they would be treated at a different institution, but then come back for uh, follow-up. The whole brain is hippocampal sparing whole brain. Uh, exciting, I think this is the first trial to allow MR only planning of uh, external beam radiotherapy. So planning without uh, the use of a CT simulation. Also, patients are not ineligible if they have uh, metastases within or near the hippocampal structures. You just spare as much as you can. So, uh, for example, sparing the entire left uh, hippocampus and most of the right might be just as good as bilateral uh, hippocampal sparing. So, one of the reasons my slides are in the four by three ratio and not 169 is that this trial was first presented in 2016. And it took till uh, late 2018 for it to finally open. And it had to quickly go on hold because of the uh, presentation of the CC001 uh, results. There were very few patients accrued at that time. And it was amended and reopened. And then, unfortunately, the pandemic uh, hit us and uh, had an impact on accrual. So the expected accrual rate was for. Uh, patients per month. There's been a few months where we've met that, but of course, uh, in the special context that we're in, that's, uh, that's been difficult. But I think we're on track now to uh, complete the trial. Just at my institution, I think over the past 10 days, we've accrued uh, three patients. We're now at a total of 55 patients. What that does mean is that there's uh, probably at least uh, uh, three years left. And there, there's an opportunity for new centers to join the trial. It's open through the CTSU uh, process. So uh, most American centers can quite easily join this trial. In the context of the pandemic, we've had to make some uh, changes. Uh, there's been a drop in accrual during the early pandemic. And now to accommodate centers that want to do remote follow-up, uh, we've adopted the oral trail making tests. So for those that are familiar with the uh, usual cognitive battery of Hopkins verbal learning, controlled oral word association and trail making, trail making is one that uh, you can't really do in its standard form over the phone because it, it requires tracing, but there's an oral version that's been uh, substituted for those centers that want to do uh, telephone uh, follow-up. This was also a uh, trial that was difficult for some uh, planning systems and some uh, uh, changes have been made to make it easier for the users of those uh, planning systems. So uh, why has accrual been a little bit more uh, difficult than expected? We've surveyed some of the participants and some of the answers we got back was uh, you know, lack of being able to accrue uh, Spanish speaking patients. Unfortunately, it's a debate about the validity of the work that's been done on the neurocognitive battery in those patients, and hopefully at some point oh, we can include them. Of course, there's not much I can do to help with the uh, pandemic. I think hopefully things are getting better and we've made um, it possible to uh, follow the patients uh, remotely. The size limit or Diameter of the metastasis, I don't think there's much uh, we can do about, but the number of metastasis, I think if it continues to be an issue, as long as it remains within the same total volume, we could probably increase the upper limit of the number of metastasis. There has been patient preference. I would say that some of that patient preference is physician preference that's been transmitted to uh, patients and of course the exclusion criteria, but I think we already have a nice ongoing trial for patients having had uh, surgery. And I don't think we want to um, make this trial less clean uh, by including those patients. So what can I conclude? I think you know, having a high level of evidence in the treatments that we uh, perform is useful. Uh, no matter the outcome of this trial, I think it will be helpful to the care of these patients in the future. This is the first comparison of hippocampal avoiding whole brain and memantine to radio surgery. So we get to know now with the improvements that have been made to whole brain, how close are we to radio surgery? Are we really close to the cognitive outcomes or still not so much? Uh, we're gonna know through this trial. Accrual to trials where patients could receive both treatments off trial is never gonna be easy. So like I said, there's 
patient biases, but probably more importantly, uh, physician biases in this situation. I've certainly seen uh, patients randomize where the physician was crossing their finger, they would get radio surgery, they got radio surgery, and now they've been dealing for months with uh, radiation necrosis and the complications thereof, and now they, they maybe regret what they wished for. I think multi-center trials offer unique opportunities. Like I said, in this case, we're going to have a lot of different devices. Hopefully someone out there with a ZAP uh, can join the trial and we can compare all these different uh, dosimetries. And again, like I said, I think there's still time to open uh, the trial for those that don't already have it open. If I want to say some uh, provocative things, I think uh, in my practice, uh, I, I don't want to be the specialist of the device. You know, I don't know who would have wanted to be a specialist in iron lungs uh, to treat polio. You'd rather be a specialist of the disease. So I'd rather be known as a brain metastasis specialist and have radio surgery just be one of different tools in my uh, tool chest to manage this disease. I can give you the example. This is a patient, a young patient that was seen in the emergency department with these multiple miliary brain metastases from his lung cancer. And this is his MRI uh, two weeks later. I assure you that change is not due to any form of radiation, but due to his targeted therapy. And there'll be more and more of these cases. And I think we'll be asked as people that deliver radiation or radio surgery to demonstrate really what the benefit of uh, our treatments are uh, to these patients. And the more prospective evidence we have, uh, the better. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presence and uh, for your attention to my presentation. Thank you, David. And uh, thank you for organizing and leading this uh, important study and, and interesting and thought provoking. And um, and um, I'm going to have a few questions myself about it, but I'm going to lead off with uh, one question here from someone in the audience. And uh, this regards your slide of the RTOG uh, 0614 versus the NRG CC001 slide. I guess this is earlier in your talk. And yeah. uh, you made reference to a relative reduction of 20% uh, out of a 10% absolute risk. And that was the question. Are we? Looking here at a, a 2% absolute risk reduction? No. So the, the, uh, the different trials look at uh, cognitive failure in different ways, uh, mainly in how you treat a patient being deceased. So to me, a patient that's deceased is not thinking clearly, and they count as a cognitive failure. So often these uh, relative reductions are out of a pretty big number. We know that at least half of the patients uh, will have a cognitive decline. Again, when that gets, depending on how you count uh, uh, death or failure to complete a questionnaire, these are relatively large numbers. There's definitely not 2%. So someone said, could you show us dose distribution, WRT planning? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, w, well, but explain to me, what is WRT? So, so I guess it's a whole brain radiotherapy. So, oh, okay, okay, whole brain. So okay. I can say that the hippocampal avoiding plans used to be something very complicated and not so much. And uh, the trial has had to account for, yeah, but what if you have a metastasis close to one of the hippocampi and you can spare most of it? How do you measure that? But I, I hope in future presentations to have some pretty good looking plans where we make sure we're treating all of the visible disease, but by sparing as much as the, uh, the hippocampi as possible. And so you don't have a dose distribution here that you can show us, do you? Uh, not, e not easily. If someone wants to email me, I'll be happy to share with them. Uh, uh, I think the other thing that's becoming exciting is some of the software vendors have templates that can be shared between users. And I think that's a way sometimes to uh, share experience with other centers. Okay. Um, Someone else was asking a question that was kind of related to something I was going to ask you. And uh, um, how does momentine work? And given if we think we know, does it make sense to add it in with radio surgery? Huh. So, I mean, it's an NND agonist. It's been used in uh, other situations of uh, brain uh, trauma. Uh, from other causes than radiation with not, not that much success as far as my understanding of the literature. It 
I, I don't know if it has an antioxidant or anti-inflammatory property. In reality, in medicine, in many things, you give someone a drug and they do better and exactly what happened on the molecular level, I don't know. Um, I think the cognitive impact of radio surgery is low enough as to not justify adding, uh, even though it's a relatively well-tolerated drug, uh, adding the potential toxicities of a drug for a treatment that already has minimal uh, cognitive impact. So yeah, it works through GABA. So it's kind of part to, as part of a deterioration of neurons as they die, things to be a, in GABA mediated phenomenon. So I, I kind of get that. And so, but what if the, what if the lesion was in the, let's say the motor cortex or something particularly sensitive? Would it make sense to use bimantine in any way? Well, I, I a, think it's a, it's a dirt cheap drug. drug. And compared to placebo has almost the same toxicity profile as placebo. So I've certainly extended it in my practice well beyond a whole brain radiotherapy for metastasis. Someone has a large uh, glioma, why not? Gotcha. Someone has okay. why not? So I would say if someone is getting radio surgery and has a significant part of their brain irradiated, it, okay. I mean, it's not unreasonable. It's not a situation in which I'm aware of it having been tested though. Understand, okay. Um, someone said, are you expecting greater number of metastasis patients in the future uh, with delays in presentation and slower treatment? So I guess someone's just, it's a rhetorical comment about the, the slower accrual than expected. Any, I mean, to me, it sounds like things are speeding up. Would you not agree? I, I think things are doing, uh, are doing better. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I, this is not a disease in which patients, uh, it's not breast cancer. There aren't patients out there that have gone a year without being diagnosed because of the pandemic. I mean, unfortunately, uh, they, they may have presented already with slightly more advanced uh, brain metastasis, but they're not, uh, there's not a pent up demand for brain metastasis treatment because of the pandemic. My presumption, someone's asking about sparing of hair. And my presumption is that you're still seeing um, loss of hair in the setting yeah. of uh, hippocampal avoiding. I have one of my own studies I can quote. Uh, we, we've done the hair sparing IMRT, and I've also used a topical uh, free radical scavenger as sort of a hair sparing shampoo. Uh, and unfortunately, I haven't used that in a randomized trial yet, but I think there is probably a little bit more sparing in uh, these uh, IMRT cases than when you just use uh, two lateral opposed fields. But of course, patients still lose their hair. It does grow back. Some of these patients were already bald because of nature or chemotherapy, but that is certainly one of the disadvantages of uh, whole brain radiotherapy. So these patients are gonna, gonna end up looking like me with a few hairs. Okay, um, let me see. So uh, someone asked about integrated boost whole brain with tomotherapy uh, with uh, 10, uh, 10 fractions of three gray for elective brain radiotherapy and escalated to uh, the gross tumor volume by one to two gray per fraction. Do you consider this? Uh, let me, I'm trying to digest this question and give it to you. Yeah. It's kind of complex. I mean, we've done, there's been a bunch of trials where you can uh, you know, uh, give more radiation. It's, with the technology we have now, it's easier than it ever was to the gross metastases. In the trial, the goal is to try to keep, to try to answer one question, but I must say that in the IMRT arm with the hippocampal avoidance, we do contour the gross tumor volume, so the metastases that are visible, and we make sure they get an adequate uh, amount of radiation and within the variability that, that's, a, that's allowed in any uh, radiotherapy plan, you can make sure they get on the higher end of uh, what's allowed in that variability. Um, I want to ask questions about, um, well, number one, um, why, what is it about whole brain radiotherapy that results in the decline? Uh, what is the mechanism? What is the... What is the mechanism? I don't know. Uh, if, it's if it's an underlying vascular phenomenon, if it's uh, stem cells in the hippocampi that uh, are killed by the, the normal 
DNA toxic effects of radiation that would make some sense in the, the early impact on cognitive function. So uh, patients that get whole brain, there is, they can get cognitive decline you know, uh, five years later, uh, but they do get a pretty immediate uh, uh, cognitive decline. So it's hard when something happens three or four months after the radiation to ascribe that to a vascular effect. It, yeah, so I mean, it, it, it circles back to my question about um, yeah. why sparing the hippocampus? So are you sparing the hippocampus because we're avoiding stem cells in the germinal matrix there? Or are we looking specifically at memory function and, and language function? It, to me, it's a bit of a black box. We, I mean, uh, the neurosurgeons know that if you lop out uh, a dominant uh, temporal lobe, that the impact is pretty dramatic. So we do know that those structures contribute to the functions required to answer our cognitive battery. Uh, why reducing the dose there uh, has a, a measurable, pretty significant uh, impact is, it, it just is. Well, I mean, so it's, but it may be, and this goes back to our cognitive battery. Are we, I mean, you can only have a certain set of cognitive batteries and are these memory centric and language centric cognitive tests? And uh, could there not be a whole range of other, you know, higher functioning tests that uh, higher functioning injury that goes on by irradiating large portions of the frontal lobe, for example, oh, for sure. like executive functioning. And it gets back to the whole premise here. So, um, I mean, if you can avoid, you know, and I, I'm sometimes he's can be kind of snarky, but I remember yeah. Doug Konzioka saying once about um, uh, hippocampal avoidance. He says, uh, that's a good start. Why, why not try to do even better? I understand. And, so, and, and that's, and I'm not trying to be controversial, no. you know, argumentative. Yeah, yeah. I'm just obviously, trying to. Some, some parts of the brain are obviously more sensitive. You, you don't see anybody right. come back with visual deficits from whole brain radiotherapy. It just doesn't happen. So, Right. Some functions of the brain are, are more sensitive. It just, uh, you know, and, and avoiding the areas that are more sensitive, if they don't represent a very large percentage of the whole brain, that, you know, that might be uh, more feasible and more beneficial. So it's, it's, I mean, it's anecdotal, but my own experience, what I find most impacted in patients with um, whole brain radiotherapy is, is executive functioning. Um, the kind of the joy in life, the willingness to kind of get out and conquer new things. And I'm not sure how good our battery of tests that we have kind of assesses that. Right. And that's kind of the question I'm leading to. And, you know, understand that I, I come at all radiation from this uh, neuromodulation, radiomodulation pr perspective that I'm quite interested in, so quite theoretical. But the idea is that the, the original form of, of neuromodulation, I would argue, is we discovered from whole brain radiotherapy. Somehow, some way, that, that radiation downregulated regions of the brain. And so it's I would argue that it's not just the hippocampus that we're downregulating with whole brain radiotherapy, we're potentially downregulating other functions. And should we be doing a wider set of cognitive tests? Sure. Uh, people are just also very tired and it's hard to do much when you're, or be motivated about anything when you're just very tired and their exactly. tiredness and sleepiness and just general malaise after a whole brain, uh, which is also difficult to quantify. Someone want to see a, see you? I don't know if you want to turn on your video. I you're, can't. You you've prevented me from turning on my uh, my they, video. They can't believe what a pretty face you got. Over and I, I I I got a shirt that the, one of the benefits of the pandemic is it seems to be tolerated now to go to work in jeans and a t shirt, which wasn't uh, two years ago, but now seems to be tolerated. But I, I I put on a suit jacket just for this, and I've got. At least you're not in your underwear or something. Um, so could you elaborate on planning an MRI and not in the CT scan? What are the advantages in MRI as opposed to CT planning? Yeah. So, I mean, you want to do a good job about treating the brain and you want to make sure you're not missing any metastases, that you're avoiding the hippocampi. 
you can't do this with a CT. So at a minimum, what people have been doing, you have to get an MRI and co-register it to the CT. You want an MRI, you would think that's as fresh as possible. I don't want to be deciding on what I'm treating from an MRI from two weeks ago. So we like to do planning MRIs, but then there's errors related to co-registering, but also for many people, they can't get funding for doing the two tests. You know, So the funder says, look, your patient had an MRI two weeks ago. You get one planning study. I'm not paying for both. So now we have a, a variety of fancy algorithms that can go extract out of the MRI the uh, information we need about uh, attenuation uh, coefficients to calculate radiation dose. And we can do the whole process uh, without getting the CT scan. So it's maybe a little less radiation for the patient, uh, one less appointment, maybe it's easier to fund. Uh, and those are the potential uh, uh, benefits. I, I think in my department, I would think five years from now, uh, hopefully we have in radiation oncology more MRIs and very few uh, CT scanners, especially since there are fewer and fewer absolute contraindications to having uh, MRIs. We have all these implantable devices that are now MR conditional or uh, radiologists that are not as nervous as they used to be. Gotcha. Um, uh, any comment on uh, radiosurgical treatment done with a, a VMAT-like solution versus that with uh, multiple individual yes. ICU centers? So I expect that uh, a lot of patients on this trial will have these VMAT treatments, potentially, you know, with small margins, with dosimetry that doesn't seem as exciting as the dosimetry for like those devices that are dedicated to radiosurgery, uh, uh, whether one of the devices you've been involved with or with a, a, a cobalt using device. And I think this will be a nice mix of all those where one, we collect the plans so we can say, just number wise or dosimetry wise, how different are these plans? And when everybody was trying their best and then correlate that with uh, outcome. So if it turns out that a VMAT treated patient where people were doing their best, where they're following the same dose guidelines has a higher chance of getting necrosis than a patient treated on a dedicated device, that's useful information. You know, I think planning studies have their uh, limitations. If I own a specific device and I'm doing a planning study, I can make the device I want come out looking better. Or if I can choose evaluation criteria that also uh, favor one device to another. If, you, if you're evaluating devices on how much radiation they give to someone's toe, uh, you know, a CyberKnife or a Linac will never come out ahead, but maybe that's not the most important metric. Gotcha. Um, well, I mean, one last Kind of question. It's it's I'm not it's fully baked out. Well, maybe a couple more. Um, any so tie, uh, so any specific MR sequences you recommend for treatment planning or are part of this study? So uh, there, there's a little bit of leeway depending on the device that people have. So we're expecting, of course, like at least uh, you know a Tesla and a half of uh, uh, magnet strength, but it can be uh, of course higher. Uh, I, they only need to have at least a single dose uh, GAD. And then there's a lot of papers these days about uh, comparison of true T1s to something like an, an MP rage to speak in the Siemens talk. And uh, I think it's anybody's choice between the different variety of sort of T1 weighted sequences that are pretty uh, standard for, uh, for these pathologies. Um, and Comment once, this is your last question here. Um, comment a little bit more on targeted therapies and their relevance to how we look at doing treating brain metastasis. So if I look, I've been involved in this project with Dr. Sperduto looking at the graded prognostic assessment. So the prognosis of patients treated for brain metastasis. And I can say over the, the the past 20 years, there's been a dramatic improvement in the prognosis of patients with brain metastasis. And I find it hard to believe that we're responsible for most of that. We're responsible for some of it. I think we're less pessimistic in when we care for these patients. I mean, many patients with brain metastasis have a better outcome than many cancers we treat, quote unquote, with uh, curative uh, intent. 
Um, so being more aggressive gets better outcomes, but the impact on these patients of EGFR inhibitors that cross the blood-brain barrier, of new HER2 inhibitors that cross the brain barrier, that dual immunotherapy and melanoma, these are dramatic impacts. And the evidence that adding radiation, whether it's radio surgery or whole brain, on top of that uh, makes people live longer is weak, is very weak. And uh, it shouldn't be that weak. We should be able to uh, document that there's some added benefit uh, for you know, a melanoma patient that's going to get a dual immunotherapy that has four or five brain metastases, that there's some documentable benefit to adding radio surgery to that. And I, and I think that there's some trials that are ongoing, and I hope there would be more of them to try to uh, document that there's really a benefit from doing that because there is a risk, even if the risk isn't very large, sure. anybody who's dealt with difficult uh, radiation necrosis, that's an unpleasant complication. You know, what do you, you know, you're closer to this to me, closer to this than me, um, but what do you, what's your sense of the overall response rate of brain metastases in patients who have good response to these EGFR inhibitors or other immunotherapy type approaches? So the most dramatic drugs have somewhere around, like whether it's a 70 or 80% objective response rate. I can tell you that radio surgery, people quote large numbers, but those are numbers for local control for not progressing. They're not response rates. You, you don't have 80% radiological response from any kind of radiation. You, know, you might have in some cases, 80% local control, crude, uh, but that's not the same thing. Uh, so some of these drugs, the benefit is very dramatic. Of course, it's a minority of patients now that are have a tumor for which they can get one of these drugs, but that percentage is growing slowly. There are more and more of these uh, targets being discovered and the drugs are getting better. HER2 breast cancer is a perfect example. You know, through 10 different generations of drugs, they've gone from pretty useless for brain metastasis to not so bad now, and I assume they're going to get more potent as time goes by. So, here's the, so the question: is, If a patient has a a great systemic response, uh, what is the likelihood that they're going to have a good CNS response? That's kind of what, yeah. They highly correlate for if the they drug, do. Okay. I mean, okay. if you're getting Herceptin, you're going to have a dramatic uh, systemic response. The drug just doesn't get into your head. You're not going to have a dramatic brain response. But if you're getting osimertinib or larotrectinib, or any of these TKIs that penetrate the CNS to a similar extent than they do the rest of the body, it's highly uh, correlated. Very good, okay. Well, look, David, I thank you very much for spending your morning here with us, or now maybe your afternoon. Um, thank you everyone in our audience for joining us today. I uh, wish you good luck, David, with the study, and uh, some of you who maybe are in a position to join the study, I encourage you to do so. Uh, David's a stand-up guy, and I think we're answering some important questions here. So right. thank you all for joining, and uh, stay safe. Have a great day. Thank you. Ciao.